I'm Crystal Hart and welcome to the Crystal Hart Show. Today we take you to the American Film Institute in Silver Spring, Maryland, just outside of Washington, D.C., where the U.S. Postal Service honors four great filmmakers who captured the many scenarios of the American experience. These extraordinary directors, Frank Capra, John Ford, John Huston, and Billy Wilder, created some of the most iconic scenes in American cinema. They gave audiences an unforgettable, and in some cases, deeply personal vision of life. It's wonderful of the post office to do this, to remind a new generation of these great directors from my parents' generation. Uh, I met Frank Capra in 1972 when he wrote his autobiography, The uh, Name Above the Title, and uh, in the last stage of his life he was so generous and so uh, giving. And uh, that week, uh, SMU in Dallas showed all of Capra's uh, biggest films. It's Wonderful Life and Lost Horizon. Uh, it happened one night and a star from each film came. And I think that speaks to the, um, to the love they had for this uh, great individual. The thing I really remember about that week is on Saturday morning at SMU, Southern Methodist University in Dallas, and this was in the early 70s, the auditorium filled up with uh, counterculture people, you know, hippies and people with scraggly beards and uh, people who weren't uh, interested in the culture, and they watched It's a Wonderful Life, and about 10 minutes in, the entire auditorium started weeping weeping and these were college kids in the 70s and by the end of it the whole place was in a puddle uh, and I just I think it's a wonderful tribute that uh, a generation later uh, Frank Capra's film could have that effect um, so I think it's great that we still have the Postal Service I think it's great that they honor uh, icons of our culture uh, and I think we need to remember these wonderful directors well, I think they, um, the Citizen Stamp Advisory Committee looks at uh, lots of research, lots of background, lots of history, and um, uh, we agreed that these four directors represented a particular era in filmmaking and were so distinctive, so different, and collectively so exciting that uh, that's how we came up with uh, Ford and Capra and Houston and Wilder. Well, it's, it's really interesting. Um, film uh, started rather slowly, actually, in, in uh, postal history, um, and uh, really did not come into its own until the 90s. And I really credit that with Carl Malden, uh, the great late actor and president of the uh, Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences. Carl was on the Citizen Stamp Advisory Committee and I think he brought to that discussion a sense that film needed to be part of postal history as well. And that started the Legends of Hollywood, Hollywood series which uh, began with Marilyn Monroe and has uh, recognized uh, si 16 great, great uh, American film artists. Uh, but now we um, uh, we have these four directors and uh, I think that um, the sense of popular culture in our society, in our country, in our world is something that the Postal Service is really uh, very focused on and understanding of and uh, respectful of and so now it's really become part of postal history as well. It's important to appreciate the inclusion in the design of the stamps um, signature moments from the film. So the searchers, uh, John Ford stamp includes the last shot of the film, the searchers, John Wayne uh, leaving uh, the cabin, Ethan Edwards, his character has just brought back Debbie, his niece. The film's trajectory is really about uh, vengeance but also redemption and, and once he's delivered her back to civilization, he's disqualified from inclusion with the family and with this new civilization because of the violence he's had to use in order to get her back. Um, in the Capra stamp, you see an image from It Happened One Night with Clark Gable and Claudette Colbert. Um, this is a carnivalesque film full of comic inversions, and in this scene, Colbert's character, who's an heiress, 
teaches Gable, the world, world-wise journalist, how to flag down a car. They're trying to hitchhike, and she pulls up her skirt famously to get the driver to stop. The Houston stamp features an image of Bogart with the Maltese Falcon sculpture. Um, and so this, again, is a film, an adaptation of the Dashiell Hammett novel. But it's been a film that critics argue is, is sort of the, the original film noir um, in that it deals in dark uh, style and form, but also uh, has a character, a hero, who negotiates the murk of the criminal underworld. Um, but somehow, even though he's fallen and compromised, uh, maintains his sense of honor, his own personal sense of honor. And so in that way, is an interesting American hero. Um, the Wilder stamp features Marilyn Monroe, a character from uh, Some Like It Hot, and, and some sort of stylized image of the setting of that film. It doesn't include Jack Lemmon and Tony Curtis, who were the leads in that film. But Some Like It Hot is arguably Wilder's signature because it um, demonstrates the sort of comic inversions that he was so fond of. And it's an anarchic comedy, but it has a very jaundiced eye, like all of his films. Wilder, of course, was an emigre from Austria to the US fleeing the rise of Nazism. And so within his comedy, there's always a sense of, of um, of a compromised world. Um, so the USPS has done a terrific job to select these moments and include them in the design of the stamps. On behalf of everyone here at AFI Silver, uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the American Film Institute and the AFI Silver Theater and Cultural Center. We couldn't be more delighted to be involved in this uh, dedication ceremony and, be, and to be celebrating these four great film directors. John Ford, Frank Capra, John Houston, and Billy Wilder, all four of whom are recipients of AFI's Life Achievement Award, are also very frequent visitors to the AFI Silver Theater screens. And they and their works remain very much alive to us today. In AFI's mission statement, we talk about preserving the history of the motion picture, honoring the artists in their work, and educating the next generation of storytellers. And here at AFI Silver Theater and Cultural Center, we take that mission very seriously seven days a week, 52 weeks a year. With the more than 600 films we screen annually, we celebrate our shared American film heritage and history, keeping these great works of popular art alive and vibrant for today's audience. And we do it by showing them the way they were meant to be seen, on a big screen with a gathering of the community in a theatrical setting. Movies aren't just a form of entertainment. They also offer a window into our history and heritage. They help tell the story of America. Stamps do the same thing. Stamps are more than postage. They also honor our past and celebrate our achievements. They encourage us to learn more about the people, places, and ideas that have shaped the American experience. Make no mistake, the four great film directors featured on these stamps made lasting contributions to our culture. With these stamps, we're bringing these filmmakers out from behind their cameras and putting them in the spotlight so that we can learn more about them. In addition, I want to remind everyone that the great film director's stamps are forever stamps. They'll always be good for first class postage, no matter what our rate. Now I have another great honor of introducing another leader of the American Film Institute, her life's blood also resides in this wonderful institution where we are today. She uh, is a leader in the world of stamps, a leader in the world of cinema. She's the chair of the Citizen Stamp Advisory Committee, a group of distinguished Americans who help the Postmaster General decide who and what should be honored with stamps. She is the President Emeritus of the American Film Institute and remains a member of its Board of Directors. She spent more than 25 years as the AFI President and became one of America's longest serving nonprofit chief executives. During her presidency, the AFI received increased recognition as one of America's great cultural and educational resources. Her distinguished career also includes serving as chair of the advisory board for the Peabody Awards. She has been honored multiple times with many awards that reflect her passionate belief in the moving image arts. And I think she's one of the nicest and one of my most favorite people in the world. 
Please welcome Jean Pickering Furstenberg. We are recognizing uh, four great directors today, but the Postal Service really started very slowly in terms of recognizing uh, the world of film. In 1944, there was a three cent stamp on the 50th anniversary of the motion pictures, and they depicted soldiers looking at a screen. Uh, in 19, 1944, 1975, there was a 10 cent stamp for D.W. Griffith, and they had the image of a camera behind him. In 1977, there was a 13 cent stamp on the 50th anniversary of the talking movie. That was it until 1990, when there were four classic movies that Sam identified earlier. Things really started to change in the mid-90s when the legend of Hollywood series began with Marilyn Monroe, uh, who was one of the biggest selling stamps in stamp history. There have been 15 distinguished actors since then and one director. I have no idea how Alfred Hitchcock got in there, <laughs> but, but he did. Now, he is, of course, British, but he spent a lot of time here, and he made many of his great films here. Uh, in 1999, there were six com uh, mu movie composers. In 2003, uh, American filmmaking behind the scenes that recognized 10 uh, disciplines behind the scenes. And not to be forgotten, in 2010, uh, the Black Heritage Series uh, celebrated the great Oscar Michaud, who brought uh, films throughout uh, the South uh, for black audiences. Um, I had the uh, honor of knowing uh, Frank Capra, John Huston, and Billy Wilder. Um, I never met John Ford. Um, I did not attend the first Life Achievement Award, which honored John Ford in 1973. But I watched the video of that evening, I read the script of that evening, and I scanned the attendee list of that evening, and in my mind, it's really a singular moment in American history. And because we're here in Washington, I wanted to spend a few minutes telling you about that night. You have to go back a few years because it was in the Rose Garden of the White House when Lyndon Johnson signed the enabling legislation in September of 1965, creating the National Endowment for the Arts and the National Endowment for the Humanities. And he said in the Rose Garden, we will create an American Film Institute. Two years later, the AFI was created. And its goal is and has always been, as Ray said, to preserve the heritage and advance the art of film and television in the United States. OK, so here we are, 1967, the AFI. In 1968, Richard Nixon is elected the 37th President of the United States, and he's reelected in 1972, and the Watergate controversy is beginning. John Ford, preeminent American director, is quite ill. And the AFI had been dreaming of creating a celebration of great American film artists. It was a singular moment, and AFI seized it. And on February 26th, 1973, the Board of Trustees of the American Film Institute established the AFI Life Achievement Award to be given annually to a member of the film creative community, whose talent in a fundamental way has advanced the film art. Think about this. Less than five weeks later, 
on March 31, 1973, the first Life Achievement Award was presented to John Ford, the Beverly Hills Hotel in Los Angeles, and President Richard Nixon attended, and after John Ford received the Life Achievement Award, Richard Nixon gave him the Presidential Medal of Freedom. The President of the United States of America awards the Presidential Medal of Freedom to John Ford. In the annals of American film, no name shines more brightly than that of John Ford. Director and filmmaker for more than half a century, he stands preeminent in the craft, not only as a creator of individual films of surpassing excellence, but as a master among those who transformed the early motion pictures into a compelling new art form that developed in America and swept the whole world. As an interpreter of the nation's heritage, he left his personal stamp indelibly imprinted on the consciousness of whole generations, both here and abroad. In his life and in his work, John Ford represents the best in American films and the very best in America. Let me just end with a couple of comments about uh, the three other uh, eminent directors that we recognize today. Frank Capra never, never forgot his humble origins. His parents couldn't read or write, but his father kissed the ground when they arrived in California on that long trip from Italy. And I think it's very clear why all of his films had a patriotic tone and inspirational spirit. He uh, was also quite witty and was heard to say, behind every successful man is an astonished woman. John Huston was close friends with Orson Welles. And this is what Orson Welles said of John Huston at his Life Achievement Award presentation. We've been friends since the world was young. We have heard the chimes at midnight. We have turned the moon to blood. Indeed, they had good times together. Um, and I think that uh, Houston uh, could be seen in many of the stories that he told. Um, Billy Wilder was quite different. Um, he said at his Life Achievement Award, I have ten commandments. The first nine are that no one shall be boring and the Tenth Commandment for all directors is, Thou shall have final cut. <laughs> um, thank you all for coming today. Um, a highlight uh, of Wilder's career provides probably the best apology anyone can ever have in life. At the conclusion of Some Like It Hot, you all recall Joey Brown was playing the playboy Osgood Fielding III when his fiance, Jack Lemon, reveals that he is a man, and Osgood's response was, nobody's perfect. <laughs> Thank you so much. And the perfect emeritus. Now we have one final treat for you. 
I'm pleased to introduce the Associate Dean and Director of Film and Media Studies of Georgetown University, a man who understands the power of media to enlighten and entertain. He is also an editor and author. His credits include publications including Thelma and Louise Live, The Cultural Afterlife of an American Film, as well as articles about television news coverage of war and violence. His next book is entitled True Flood, which will focus on efforts to chronicle the Hurricane Katrina disaster. He is not just an observer of film, he is also a filmmaker himself. His works include Both Into One, a short film about Georgetown University's work with a group that promotes peace between Israelis and Palestinians. And I know that we will get great pleasure from hearing his thoughts on this day, so please welcome Dr. Bernie Cook. Just two years before the AFI Career Awards uh, that we've just seen to John Ford, Macmillan published Frank Capra's autobiography in 1971, and it was called The Name Above the Title. Um, you get a sense from that of Capra's sense of his own importance and worth, um, but you also, I think, importantly, get a strong sense of the, the shifting perceptions of the role of the director, at least great directors um, in American film and American culture. Um, in the 50s, after World War II in France, you had a series of critics, uh, among them future filmmaker Francois Truffaut, looking at American films, a lot of the American films that hadn't been seen in Europe because of the war, and recognizing in the output of American film directors signatures, artistic signatures. And this idea was called the auteur theory by the French, that filmmakers could be the authors of their work. This idea migrated back to the U.S. Uh, Andrew Sarris was an important figure uh, in New York writing about the director as, as author. And so Capra, when he writes about and, and sort of is trying to position his own legacy as the name above the title, I think speaks to this ascent of the director um, within American film culture. And, and I think we want to recognize all four of these very significant figures as names above the title. Let me say something just briefly about these specific names. Um, as Sam has mentioned, uh, two of the four directors were emigres to the U.S. Um, Capra from Sicily, as was mentioned, as a young boy. Wilder, as an adult, um, fleeing the rise of Nazism after having established himself as a writer and filmmaker in, in Austria and in Europe. Um, Ford was born Sean Aloysius Ofini, uh, the child of a large Irish immigrant family. Houston also child of immigrants. Um, the two oldest of the filmmakers, uh, Ford and Capra, were both born in the 1890s. And of course, that means that their lives were coincident with the birth and development of the medium itself, of film. And I think that it's significant to think about the rise of film in the 20th century as both the dominant mass medium and the dominant art form of this period as being related to patterns of immigration in the 20th century, especially in the ways in which film, silent first and then sound, spoke to this nation of immigrants across difference, across language barriers. Importantly also, however, these filmmakers' products spoke about a nation and spoke about a new community and a coming together. So these filmmakers have created films that are indelible because of what they say about America. Um, one of the strong interpretive techniques for film is genre, right? This idea that films can be typed uh, according to the Western, for example, uh, the screwball comedy, the gangster film, the road movie. This auteur theory in some ways succeeds that approach by suggesting that you can identify a Frank Capra film. You can talk about a John Ford film, a Billy Wilder film, a John Huston film. Let me say something about the titles briefly. Um, as you see, each of the stamps features a design with the director himself and uh, a selected moment from each of their films. Um, and so John Ford's uh, image is accompanied by an image, really the final image of the film The Searchers from 1956, where John Wayne, playing Ethan Edwards, um, has brought back his niece, Debbie, to the family. Uh, and the, as we know, the whole trajectory of that film has been this journey of, of revenge, but also in some sense redemption. Crucially, in understanding this film and understanding Ford, 
the violence that Edwards has had to use to, to, to create this reunion and to bring family together and ensure a certain form of civilization disqualifies him from being able to continue to participate in this new experience. So he has to leave the family, and walks out, and then that famous shot, the door closes. Um, the Capra stamp features images of Clark Gable and Claudette Colbert from the 1934 film It Happened One Night. Um, this film is memorable for lots of reasons. It arguably inaugurated the genre of screwball comedy. Um, it's a film that was created and released during the Depression, and I think it's significant always to think about the context in which these films were received uh, and seen. This film is, as we know, a signature comedy. It's carnivalesque. It, it features comic inversions of class and of status. Claudette Colbert is an heiress, but she's riding the Amtrak because she doesn't have any money, trying to get away from, from obligations and, and, and to a fiancé who she thinks she loves. Clark Gable is a journalist um, and, and is um, aware of who she is and accompanies her for the story, but also falls in love with her. It's also crucially a road movie. And so it explores the transformative um, possibilities of the American road. Again, a signature way in which American cinema contributes to our idea and our sense of America. Uh, John Huston's stamp features an image of Humphrey Bogart and the Maltese Falcon from the 1941 adaptation of the Dashiell Hammett novel. Um, again, 1941 is significant here, right? This is a film that arrives at a moment of deepening darkness globally. And that film was one that Truffaut and Bazin and others, uh, French critics, identified when they talked about this idea of film noir, that these American films were dealing with um, formal and stylistic darkness, but also thematic and moral darkness. Um, importantly, Bogart plays Sam Spade, very much a fallen and compromised hero, but nonetheless, in this milieu, someone who still has honor and still holds on to values, and so therefore speaks in important ways to a certain kind of American hero. Um, and then the, the Billy Wilder stamp features an image, as we know, of Marilyn Monroe from the 1959 film, Some Like It Hot, doesn't include um, Curtis and Lemon, but we know them, and as Gene has talked about, they're, they're the, the, the other crucial performers in that film. 19, at, at Released in 1959, this is the last of the film representations, and it arrives at a moment where film was having to come to terms with a new medium, television. And so there are ways in which I think it's important to think about Some Like It Hot as a film about film in the way that Singing in the Rain was a film about film. Uh, Some Like It Hot takes up the gangster film and satirizes it. And so it's, it's talking at once about American film history, but also about, um, again, inversions and misunderstandings um, of character and of identity. It features Curtis and Lemon as two musicians who have to flee Chicago because they've inadvertently witnessed the St. Valentine, Valentine's Day Massacre. They flee dressed in drag down to Florida with uh, a female jazz ensemble that, uh, for which Marilyn is the singer. Um, and, and they end, as Jean noted, with this moment, this indelible moment in American cinema where Joe Brown is proposing or, or is trying to seal the deal with Daphne, J Jack Lemon's character, uh, and, and Lemon tries to talk him out of it, goes through a whole litany of reasons, and finally pulls off the wig to expose himself and says, I'm a man, Joe Brown says, Osgood, his character says, well, no one's perfect. Right, And so it's clear that these directors are not perfect. They're human. They collaborated significantly with, with lots of important partners. I.E.L. Diamond wrote that line for Wilder and appears in the film. But nonetheless, at their best, these filmmakers' films approached perfection. These four films, the signature films that have been selected by USPS for inclusion, are uh, among the most notable in American film history. And equally important, they speak to us about our experience as Americans. Thank you very much. Customers have until July 23rd to obtain the first day of issue postmark by mail. Affix the stamps to envelopes of your choice, address the envelopes to yourself or others, and place them in larger envelopes addressed to Postmaster, Great Film Directors Commemorative Stamp, 8616 2nd Avenue, Silver Spring, Maryland, 20910-9998. After applying the first day of issue postmark, the Postal Service will return the envelopes by mail. There is no charge for the postmark. 
All orders must be postmarked by July 23, 2012. I'm Crystal Hart reporting from the American Film Institute in Silver Spring, Maryland, just outside of Washington, D.C. Hope you've enjoyed the show and thanks for watching.